Marshall, for your lovely talk and uh, your guided meditation. Um, I, as Marshall was talking, I looked through who was here on on uh, on the Zoom call, and uh, I just want to say hello to so many people that some I see often, some I don't see a lot, um, but many of you have been a part of Empty Gates Zen Center at some point or part of the Quantum School, but all of us are trying to figure out how to manage this completely unexpected, perhaps, and um, challenging moment. Um, you know, Zen Master Sung San used to have this line and he would say, a bad situation is a good situation. And we all laughed. And we use that quite often. Oh, when things are difficult, we think, okay, maybe there's a good situation in here. And what he meant was that we wake up, we, we become present. And if there's any gift that I can see and feel out of this, this crisis is the appreciation for the very life that we have. All of us can feel the possibility of death is very close. Many of us know people who are sick. I know a few people who are struggling with the virus and the palpability of the fragility of our life is so present. And most of us spend our lives trying to deny it and avoid it. But if we can use this moment to have a deep appreciation as for just being here, if you get outside and you walk around, it's early spring. There are these beautiful flowers that are there for us. They're not asking us for anything. There's so many gifts each one of us have. And to take some moments in our, t in our day to just appreciate this aliveness, this basic aliveness, which is our Buddha nature. It's apparent in all things. And each moment, if we can wake up to it, we can perceive it. It's already here. You know, I was struck when Marshall began, began his talk having us do Kwantan Bosal chanting. Um, I thought of my own personal experience with chanting. I would have to say I was probably practicing Zen for about eight years before I began to appreciate the uh, deep practice of chanting. And what, what, it, what it felt to me finally when I got it was that it was not rational. It made no sense. It, it deeply connected below the thought feeling mind. We just become one with the chanting, allow the sound to include everything. And when I thought about the chanting, I've been working with a lot of people this week and the last couple of weeks. And what I notice is everybody in their own particularity is struggling with their minds and their hearts. And for so many people, and myself included, there are ways in which our minds and our feelings start to run the show. When Marshall read that uh, poem from Zen Master Sung Sain, the line that struck me was that he became independent from time and space. What could that possibly mean to be independent and t from time and space? He still had a body. He still had experience. And in fact, he died from it's reported at least, he died from eating rotten meat. So how could that be independent from time and space? He grew old, he died, he had experience. So how is that independent from time and space? Well, one thing that opens up for me with that is that he found a way to be non-reactive. As Marshall said, to just see, just here, 
just taste. For most of us, when we see, we evaluate right after it. When we hear, as Marshall was saying, we judge. And once we cross that barrier from just seeing to analyzing what we see, we become dependent on time and space. It doesn't mean that we're not affected. It doesn't mean that we don't react and respond. But I think what that poem is pointing to is from deep in our lower abdomen, our deep true nature, our true self center, from just hearing, just seeing, we learn to respond organically and spontaneously. But for most of us, we're, we're locked in the thoughts and the feelings, and we can't get outside of that. And for many of us in this time period, where anxiety is rising, fear is rising, sadness is rising, confusion is rising. And what I notice in myself and others is that we get wrapped up in that experience, and it creates stress, it creates tension between people. And as I've experienced in my own practice, one way to work with that is to work with chanting or maybe more specifically in the internal space of mantra practice. And if I said it took me eight years to appreciate chanting practice, it probably took me about 35 years to begin to appreciate the value of mantra practice. But in these moments that we're locked into our fears, our anxiety, and our confusion, just to begin to run a mantra internally. Basically, what I'm talking about is chanting inside. In our school, many of us use the phrase Quansay and Bosal, just what we chanted tonight. For myself, that's the mantra I use, and I just internally run it. If I'm walking and I'm doing walking meditation, then I also tie it into my feet. And what I have discovered for myself is that as I'm working the mantra, it calms down the thought process. It just, in a way, it interrupts the thought process. And as the thought feeling process gets interrupted, we can find some calmness. We can return back to that just seeing because the way we get wrapped up in our mind and our feelings is that our minds and our feelings color everything that we're experiencing. And if we want to see things more clearly, we have to have a way to return to what we in our school call before thinking. So I'd really like to encourage everybody, use your mantra. If you have one in your own tradition, use that. If you don't have one, look for a phrase, something in your spiritual life that resonates with you. But be careful. This isn't so much about meaning. When uh, this is, goes back, oh, I don't know, about 35 years ago, uh, my father was dying. And he lived in New York, and I went back to New York, and I spent about three months basically being his attendant. And one day, Zen Master Sung San came to the Zen Center in New York City, so I decided to go in to see him. And I told my father that I would talk to him and tell him about my father's situation. So after talking to Zen Master Sung San, he handed me a set of beads, just like these beads, very similar wooden beads. In fact, it's not impossible that they're, they're, they may even be the same set of beads. And um, he handed them to me and he said, give these beads to your father and tell him to do mantra. So I said, fine, no, laughing inside, knowing that my father wasn't going to do that at all. But I went home, and, I, and as soon as I got home, my father said, well, what did the Zen master say? And I said, well, he handed me these beads, and he told me to give them to you, and he told me to tell you to do a mantra. And he, he didn't even understand what mantra meant. My father was not a spiritual or religious person at all. 
And I explained to him that in our tradition, we're told it's not the meaning of the word, it's the action of the mantra. So I said, you can use any mantra you want. So my father in his deepest Jewish humor said, so I can use kiss me and tuchus, which in probably most of you know, but Yiddish tuchus means rear end. So I said, yeah, dad, if that moves you, if that works for you, go ahead, use that one. Um, of course he did not. Um, but the point is, use what works for you. It's not magic. It's just interrupting. We get on a train and we run on that train and we lose ourselves. Use the moment to come back. And of course, the deep meaning of the words literally mean hearing the cries of the world. As our mind gets clear and our heart gets open, those cries are heard. And as our mind is clear and our heart is open, that natural tendency to reach out and help is what we have. But it's not an idea, you have to do it. It's not some theoretical thing to read about and understand. It's action. Do it. Use your practice. Use your mantra. Calm your mind. Open your heart. Receive the world. And from your place, your position in the universe, reach out and help. Of course, we're six feet away now. So as we reach out to help, we, we just offer our nature. How can I help? And if we listen, if our ears are just listening, everybody will inform us what they need and do our best to offer up some help. That's how we help the community. We're all in this together. Nobody knows who's a carrier. Each one of us may be the vector that's making someone sick. We don't know all the vectors, all the people around us we may receive or we give. In our conventional life, receiving and giving are separate things. But we can see now we're all interconnected. Each one of us is both giving and receiving. So pay attention. In our temple rules, it says pay attention. Watch your step. When you're in the supermarket, how close are you getting to people? Be aware of others in time and space. Be aware of yourself in time and space. And then just in this moment, do what you can. Even if that's simply handing or getting out of the way and letting somebody get that lettuce before you get it. Just keep your heart open and stay present. <laughs>